as a painter, I'm very interested in surface and in in the in thick and thin and in the in the way one area acts against another. Like this is this is very thinly applied color here, as as opposed to something that's that's more opaque. And that really has a play in the painting that, that I like a lot. It has a kind of sensuousness. The painting is started with a ground color of this kind of nice bricky, brick red. And then I'm, I'm sort of working off of that and, and basically kind of improvising and trying to find combinations of things that surprise me a little bit. Uh, often I'll put down a color which is really kind of uh, not working very well with other colors, but I leave it because I figure that I'm going to get a kind of combination that, that is more interesting than something I've figured out beforehand. So I'm, uh, I'm playing with it in a kind of improvising way. When I start with a ground color, it almost always stays throughout the painting um, in some, some form or other. And uh, I often can't tell exactly how much of it is going to remain. But sometimes I have the goal in mind to just keep a, keep a lot of it and to keep playing off against it. So it has a way of unifying color areas. Uh, all through the painting if that ground color keeps showing in some way or other. In recent years I've been using uh, woodcuts and uh, to often to start a, uh, an idea for a painting and that's what, uh, that's what I have up on the wall. I find it a useful thing for me for organizing the, the subject matter and organizing the composition with a woodcut you have the ground color, which is the black. And then you interrupt the black with, by cutting into it, so you're getting whites and stuff. And what you're doing basically in the woodcut is moving in and out of that, of that ground, basically. You've got the ground color and you're moving forward and backward from it. That's, that's the thinking about it. And with a, with a color, with a, with a ground on the canvas, it's, it's a similar thing. A painting can be, in many ways, subtler than, than a, uh, a woodcut, at least the way I use it. I like a woodcut that's just that's bang, one thing or the other. In painting, I often like things that are very subtle and very closely related. But the ground does that for me in the painting. It's a kind of a terracotta or brick-colored ground that I'm using. And then by using another kind of reddish-brown, and very thinly on top of that. You're still seeing a lot of the ground color through here. But what that does is, is bring this forward somewhat. Then by increasing the, the light color here around it, I'm bringing it forward a lot. But both of them are still working with that ground color. I'm either working away from it a little, into it, more brown, less brown, in a sense and staying very much related to it so that when, when I introduce a green like that to, a, an, to another extent, an orange, it, it suddenly becomes a very strong accent. I just love that, that ability to move in and out of the ground as a way of building the painting and building space. At a certain point, I'll, I'll put the... Uh, I put the woodcut aside because I don't want to just be uh, imitating it and I don't want to look at it again and then while I'm working on the painting. I want the painting to tell me, the painting will tell me if, I'm, if I stay tuned to it, it'll tell me what it wants. Often successful paintings are that way. They, they begin to dictate to you and you follow it. And that's a lovely way to work if you don't get into uh, you know, a problem somewhere. Sometimes paintings present problems and you've got to fight through it. But you try to get back to something that kind of flows finally, if it's going to really look good. You know, it shouldn't look like you fought over it and somebody, somebody gave up, <laughs> either the painting or you. <laughs>
Is that a good height? I think. Okay, I wanted to show you a little bit about how I went about this big painting. So the the subject was jazz, and I've and I've been doing a lot of music paintings the past few years, but I decided that I'd like to do a big painting that had a lot of specific jazz figures in it. I went to the library and got a got some books out on uh, jazz photographs, and Xerox the ones some of the ones that I were, was particularly interested in. And then the, the process for me is to sort of go through those with very small note cards. And they're small because then I can sort of get a grip on what, what interests me about the particular uh, figure in a way that's very concise. And, it, and I'm not investing a lot of paper and big size and all effort into it. What I want is a kind of note about what really interests me. So then these become a very uh, pliable sort of thing. I can, I can lay these out on a table and sort of look at them and decide, uh, make some decisions about what to use, what might go with what, and begin to kind of figure out what elements go into a composition. Then it's a matter of moving from that to sketches which organize a space in a certain way. So I decide that, that one figure is going to go there, the other here, the other here, and and I want a kind of overall sense of, of composition to it, which I then do with a kind of strong dark and light like that. This is where I started that idea. And then, then the thing about paper is that you can add to it. So I decided at one point that would make a better composition. And then at another point that that should have more space around it like that. And then that it was ac would actually be more complete with, with a further section. And, you know, there's nothing to stop me from adding more and more or going this way or this way because it's only paper and I'm just sticking it together with tape. But it's a, it's a kind of a nice pliable way to work on a composition. So at this point, then, what I do is, is put a grid on this and on the painting. I don't draw lines like this on the painting, but I make dots where the lines intersect. So when I'm working on the composition on the painting, uh, I then redraw it with chalk. But I'm not sticking to exactly what's there, but I know that the scale is what I want. So when I'm doing that figure, I know that it's, it's going to be in that area of the painting. And it helps me so I'm not having to rework on all of the proportion things while I'm, uh, while I'm drawing out the painting. In talking about grounds, this whole painting was started with a, a nearly black ground. It's a blackish brown in this case. I didn't want a, a complete black or a dead black. So it has a lot, of, a lot of umber in it. It's a way of getting into the painting in a kind of free way and still having a lot of control over it. Like in other uh, paintings that I've done, I'm in a sense limiting the color. If you really think about it, this. This looks like a lot of color. I mean, it, the sense is that it has a lot of color. It actually, when you analyze it, it doesn't. It's, it's, uh, it's red and orange, which is related to red, and, and, a, uh, and browns, which are all related. So that's, uh, that's, in a sense, one color. And then the other color is a kind of a, a subdued violet, which moves through it, and, but in very small amounts, as a kind of an accent to the red scheme. It's a very interesting thing about color, I think, is that often it, the most limited color looks, looks like the most. You know, color absolutely only exists in relation to, it, to other colors. That's the only way it ever exists. And that's why you can get infinite variety of color out of basically red, red yellow, blue, and black, you know because they, it's such an interrelated thing. Lots of times people that don't paint don't, or you know, aren't involved with color don't realize that. They, they think, well, green's green or blue's blue, but uh, it's, so, it's so fascinating that you can take the, the dirtiest color that you, wouldn't, you don't like even. You don't even like it. And you put it down and 
Well, as a painter, you know, you probably have done this too. You do that deliberately. You put that on and you say, now you behave yourself. <laughs> and then you, you start putting other colors around it until it gets happy, you know. And it's, ooh, look at that. Look at that. There was a, it's a kind of yellow green that looks like spring or something, you know. Before that, it looked like some kind of brown that had been walked on or something. This is a, another music theme. It's not specifically jazz. It's kind of a combination of different music modes. What I'm doing here is pasting up a very big sketch. And if you look at it closely, you can see that, there, that it's been patched up a lot. And what the patching is, is, is shifting figures around, enlarging them, making them smaller, taking one from one spot and putting it in another. As I say, it gets glued down and you can't see edges, but this fellow, for instance, is, is completely pasted in here. He was turned the other way for a while, and I didn't like the fact that the, the, the instrument was r referring out of the painting. I thought it needed to be referred back in, like the, the violinist is facing in. This, this is a way that I like to work now, which is just uh, piecing things together until I get the the composition that I like. So there's then a, the, I did a big, a big tile piece from this, which has a lot of color in it. But it starts with a with a the black and white mm -hmm. idea, and then the colors introduce into the blacks only. So in the ceramic tile piece, the blacks get worked into with these kind of bright notes of color, and what I've done with the color is to stay completely within the black with the color, so none of the white parts of the engraved tile have color in them. And then the other thing that happens in translating this from the, from the sketch to the, to the tile piece is that I, be, I start to work with the shape of the line around things, so that the, uh, the line gets, gets very thick and very thin. And uh, you can see it again over on this other side of the of the tile, where the, the, the quality of the line is worked to wide and narrow in a way that, uh, that gives a sense of light, but also just a kind of pleasure in the line itself. That's a really pretty line, uh, her silhouette. Yeah, I think so. It comes partly from, in fact, this working of the line comes from this kind of collaging of this. Mm. See how it, it just by the fact that this is pasted in, and I didn't bother going up here with all the black, makes me start to look at that as, as the line, mm. and not just as something left over. As an artist, what really interests me is that line becomes, and this is, this is true of all line in all drawing, I think. Line is either part of the form or part of the background. Mm. So a line drawing represents the background around the figure or the figure, and it can be interchangeable depending on how it's used. This line, the, the getting wider and narrower with that line, has this kind of visual functioning of being on the form or being per in places slightly behind the form. Mm -hmm. One of the things I get working with is, here's a figure spelled out, mm. and here are three figures, and you presume what they're doing, but it's just a, a kind of joy to me to simplify that into the shape that's sort of like a, a monster's head or yep. something, you know. That uh, and yet it's the other thing too. It's he's probably the drummer since there's a drum and there's prob he's probably a bass player and he's and he's the pianist. But but you know I'm not giving you much. But you, you you're okay with with us seeing that as a monster head or a nostril? Sure. Yeah. Sure. The more my <laughs> The more monsters you can find in it, the better. It's one of the qualities that I like about tile is that I, I have to, in working it, take into consideration uh, what happens within the, within the square. And the squares have a kind of um, 
an influence on the on the total look of the composition because squares have a, a, a um, I think a very deep kind of psychological thing for us you know they organize they're an organizing thing and if you go back to Lascaux in the cave are squares there's a section of one of the caves that has six squares and they're all different colors and they're all perfect perfect squares well where did that come from came from some kind of deep subconscious I think because you know they, there weren't any buildings out in the landscape or something anyway I like squares very much and I think I like I like tile because you because of the conformity to the square <laughs> Other printers will look at this and see these nice rollers here and say, why doesn't he use those? But there are little irregularities in the wood that this small roller fills in for me. And the large roller, even though it has some give to it, can miss. And I find, uh, for me anyway, it's does a much better job to take a little time and do it with this smaller roller. get used to sort of just looking at the the nap of the ink to see whether it's sufficient tight fit here. Come on, there we go. Well, I've done several woodcuts related to the music theme, and uh, in this particular case, this this is the the tuba player it's called, and uh, I'm really very interested in evoking a sense of music in the in the imagery I use of players, and uh, taking just the the visual sense of the reflections in the tuba, for instance and formalizing that into these shapes has a kind of visual equivalent of sound, I think, and you kind of feel this, 
boom, 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 moving around it. The figure coming out of the tuba is a very abstract kind of figure. There's not a line drawn around it this way. It's composed of, of very small lines moving up and down, and then this, this kind of interior linear thing that, that I really mean to be a kind of uh, a counterpoint to this heavy uh, sound here, as if this is a very delicate kind of sound that's playing with this sound. And then this I also think of as a kind of, as part of the musical thing. So you get a kind of sm smaller tempo perhaps, and then this larger tempo, and then a kind of more delicate thing. One of the kinds of drawing I do sort of consistently is um, life drawing. And uh, there's a session that I go to once a week at a friend's uh, studio where six or eight of us get together and draw from, uh, from the figure. I'm always trying to challenge myself as to um, how I can set down the, the figure and what I can get out of it. I do a, a lot of drawing with pen I like the kind of strength and the and the directional quality of pen. You you're really forced to kind of move the in in a directional way, and and when you're modeling and so on, you're following uh, the movement of the of the volumes and so on. There's one where I'm using the pen and and then a, a wider kind of brush with ink. It's one way of drawing in which you're you're really aiming at getting a a kind of a full kind of spatial uh, sense to the figure. So by not, not emphasizing the line here, it lets that arm go back. By uh, not, em not pulling the line heavily all the way around that shoulder, it actually lets this shoulder come forward. So you're playing with coming and going of the, of the edge of the form. And, um, and it makes for a, a very sensual sort of space, I think. And I think one of the hardest things in, in drawing uh, is to know what to kind of leave out and where, where to, what to emphasize and what not to emphasize. One of the things that, that students often do with any figure is to start with the head and then tack everything else onto the head. And uh, Nicolaides, the great, the great uh, drawing teacher, said the only time that you should start with a head as if you're drawing a hanged man, <laughs> because then it's really important to the gesture. But what one should really do is to start with the, the total gesture. What is, what's the figure doing? What is it, you know, what is the action of the figure? And then, then the head can be, tack, mm. can be tacked onto it mm. wherever it needs to be in relation to the, the whole. Often I'll I'll try to use just just the very fewest lines that I can and and uh, and then if you can evoke something, the volume with with just just lines, I think that's the purest kind of drawing actually. I mean all the rest of this uh, is wonderful, you know, tone and space and all of that. But but line seems to be where uh, really the essence of drawing. It's where you know you goes way back to the very earliest stuff and it's it, the interesting thing about line is that every culture in the whole world reads line and has used line and and when you think of the fact that there is no line in nature mm. that it's a total abstraction mm. uh, there aren't any when you look at a figure there are no lines there yeah. at all so there's some kind of sense of abstraction maybe built into our mind that that can that will read a line in a drawing like this what i'm doing with a line is to make it a continuous contour line and then in order to revise it i'm making another contour line mm -hmm. and i can make any I in a sense make any number of contour lines it's quite different than if i was sketching right. sketching the line over and over in order to get it so you have two two legs here 
in fact, when you read it, your eye t reads a leg here and a leg here. The, the, the edge comes and goes. But since there are no lines in nature anyway, mm. there are no lines on this figure. So if she, if she happens to move slightly this way, uh, there's a whole new line here mm. than, the, than that line. The, in, in, if she moves slightly that way, this whole line is, is incorrect because it's, mm. it's now on, on the facing part of her leg and not on the edge. So in a way, this, this has something, this has a feel that the figure is turning. As a, as a figure painter, what I'm often interested in is the fact that you can, you can uh, be very specific about some part of the figure and more general about another part, uh, and even uh, draw it in, paint it in different ways, or be, be, say, sort of flat with part of it and more volumetric with another part. And somehow or other, it can, be, it can all read fine. Mm. You know, you read it and you s and you accept it as as the figure, uh, without questioning, going back and questioning that that part of it is not finished out. The interesting thing to me is that as an observer, you don't see it as a sketch. You see it as as a full statement about the form. <laughs>liked doing portraits ever since the earliest times when I was making drawings. And in about uh, 1999, I decided to, s to start making a series of drawings of artist friends. The premise of these was that each drawing would be not more than one hour. So, so uh, I had to work quickly and I had to be very focused. And uh, it, the result, I think, were kind of a kind of freshness and immediacy in the in the drawing uh, because of uh, because of that time limitation. And each of the artists sat for me, so I, d I wasn't working from, from photographs or anything like that. The technique I was using was one of coating the paper with um, these are oil on paper, and I coated the paper with several coats of acrylic varnish. Uh, and let that dry, and then uh, worked with uh, oil paint very directly on the on the paper, so the oil paint doesn't soak in at all, and it means that I can erase it with uh, turpentine, and I can do things like you notice in the beard here. There's scratching with the palette knife, which scratch can scratch right back to the surface of the of the paper, which wouldn't happen if the paper weren't sized. So it makes, again, a very flexible kind of uh, medium for me, which I can, I can shift around and change. And I got started on a large scale uh, drawing because I wanted to make the head very important and wanted to really get into the drawing of the head. Mm. I might just uh, uh, you know, do this to show you what the scale of the drawing is, since you, you know, if you're looking at it just on the screen by itself, you can't see really what this, how large it is. The scale, I thought, was really, um, really gave me a kind of lift to work mm. that size. And, and it, it also got me into the form so that instead of just working with, with you know, outside proportions or something, it really gives you a sense to, to get in here and dig into it and see what the transitions are between forms and, and so on. This happens to be William Givler, who was dean of the art school for many, many years, and my dean when I taught there. This was done only about a year before he died, so I feel quite uh, privileged about being able to do this of him and, uh, and include him in this series. There is a kind of grandeur in people, I think. Maybe enlarging the size gives a sense that the individuals are very important and I wanted to honor artists as being artists, as, uh, you know, they plug away, they, they put all their energy and all their force into it, 
without without huge uh, monetary remuneration, obviously. I mean, some people are lucky to sell some paintings, but every artist around uh, is doing it with their, the full force of their soul in this thing. And I think that's just, just uh, really admirable. And, and uh, you know, it's one of the great traits of human beings that they can, they can be so involved in something that's in a way selfless. Now, you know, it's a kind of dichotomy with artists because they're in one way very selfish. Mm -hmm. They have to do their thing. And maybe what's really interesting about art anyway is that the single, in our time, the single individual is is getting at his view of the world which is sli as slightly different than anyone else's view. It might be radically different, it might be somewhat different, but it's very individual. And every one of anyone, everyone that works seriously at art is giving you a little sense of the ne of that other world that's beyond ours. You know, uh, you don't really. I don't plan uh, a plan out a career about how it's going to go and what it's going to involve. You just sort of you work and you work seriously about it, and eventually, y uh, you kind of look back at it after maybe, you know, 60 years or so, like I can do now, and you see that it has certain um, characteristics. Mm. You don't plan those mm -hmm. exactly, but I think you're exactly right. I think what, what mine begins to amount to is a gigantic portrait in the sense of my surroundings, you know, and, and, and certainly what I feel about it. I mean, and, you know, not just the look of it.
I started drawing probably before I can remember because, um, you know, I used to say I started drawing at five, but I don't remember actually ever not drawing.